we are chairing a session entitled Cardiac Contractility Modulation, Current and Future Clinical Applications. This is a mini symposium supported by a grant by Impulse Dynamics. And we have three presentations. Um, one, and I would like to introduce Professor Hasenfuß from Göttingen, uh, addressing unmet clinical needs in heart failure. He is an expert in the area of heart failure. He is going to discuss this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, Dr. Ricchio. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to give uh, this introduction. Now, as you all know, treatment of heart failure has uh, improved tremendously over the last decades, but uh, still there are a great number of um, uh, unmet needs uh, that need to be addressed. And this is where cardiac contractility modulation jumps in. It's my disclosure. Uh, the improvement uh, includes new drugs over the decades which are uh, listed here, which you all know, so uh, I don't have to address the details, and of course the devices, the ICDs and the resynchronization rec therapy. But despite these advances, increasing numbers of patients suffer from high rates of hospitalizations, poor quality of life, and high risk of death, and this is partially due to the improvement of the treatment of patients with myocardial infarction, survival, at least for those who come to the hospital, has increased significantly, and many of those will end up with heart failure. And uh, this is uh, uh, a slide uh, showing uh, overall survival uh, over the decades, and uh, it's uh, rather depressing to see that at least from 1987 to 2001, also there was a small improvement, uh, there was not really what we would like to see, a tremendous uh, shift in this survival curve, despite these new treatment approaches we were addressing. Now, cardiac resynchronization therapy um, improved uh, the situation in patients with heart failure, it's applicable to patients with reduced ejection fraction, those who have dyssynchrony of myocardial contraction, and it's currently the most successful and widely used device-based therapy for treatment of heart failure. This uh, shows data from the CARE-HF uh, trial. Uh, including patients with neurocard association functional class 2, 3, and 4 with the ejection fraction below 35% and a QRS of uh, above 120 uh, milliseconds. And uh, you see the mortality curves, and what is important to realize that with best medical therapy, one new mortality uh, is uh, 11% and uh, up to one year, there is no different difference between the treatments and uh, the mortality benefit of CRT becomes evident uh, after one year. And uh, with respect to heart failure hospitalization, uh, this is the figure uh, from this study. There is a 7% uh, reduction in heart failure hospitalization with CRT at one year. This is significant but uh, it's not so much. Uh, analysis from the Miracle trial uh, showed that with all parameters uh, evaluated, the total group of CRT treated patients versus placebo had a benefit in six minute walk, uh, in uh, um, uh, heart failure questionnaire, and in uh, uh, PQO2 and uh, also with respect to New York Heart Association functional class, but uh, the responder rate is not 100%, and uh, from this analysis, the responder rate uh, was calculated to be about uh, 50% only. Now, the critical question is, why is the responder rate of CRT not 100%? Uh, and rather, uh, only half of uh, 
group of patients treated with the device are, are responders. There is uh, uh, new data which clearly indicate that this is due to implantation of the device in patients with a QRS uh, below 150 uh, milliseconds. This is from uh, MADI CRT. Uh, and the effect you see uh, in the combined endpoint of uh, survival uh, and uh, heart failure development is driven by the reduction uh, of um, heart failure events and the effects are best in patients with a QRS uh, above 120 uh, milliseconds. And uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, this meta-analysis was published in Archives of Internal Medicine, which uh, includes uh, five trials, Companion, Carriage F, Reverse, Made It, CRT, and Draft. Uh, and uh, they study the effects of resynchronization therapy on the composite endpoint of death and hospitalization. And this shows you the group of patients from the various trials with the QIS uh, of 100, at least 150 milliseconds. And as you can see, there was a benefit, a significant benefit uh, in all these trials on the composite endpoint when the QIS was below 150 milliseconds, there was no uh, benefit, not in an individual trial and not in this meta-analysis. And this is a regression meter regression analysis of the effects on CRT on this combined endpoint showing that uh, there is an inverse uh, relationship between uh, QIS duration uh, uh, and uh, a positive relationship between QIS uh, duration and the benefit uh, you have with uh, uh, this uh, treatment therapy. And uh, this also is very interesting, sensitivity analysis. And this shows that what I said before holds true for patients with severe heart failure, neurocard association class three and four, but also one and two. The benefit only shows up with the QIS above 150 milliseconds. That holds true if uh, an ICD background is there or not. Uh, so. Uh, Obviously, it's uh, generally uh, applicable. Uh, so to summarize uh, this, also medical therapies have improved survival uh, in patients with reduced ejection fraction, mortality and morbidity remain high. CRTD improves uh, quality of life, hospitalization and mortality in patients with a low ejection fraction and in patients with a wide uh, QIS complex above 150 millisecond uh, seconds and CRT can slow progression also in patients with uh, mild heart failure. Again, if the QIS is above 150 millisecond and uh, approximately 40% of CRT implantations have been done in patients with a QIS of uh, 150 millisecond and this explains the low responder rate because for patients with normal QRS, no device-based therapy is available uh, to treat symptoms of uh, congestive heart failure. Uh, this is where cardiac contractility modulation comes in and uh, was developed. And uh, briefly to show you what the device is doing, you see the EKG and uh, the impulse comes shortly after the R wave uh, with uh, uh, five impulses uh, with uh, an amplitude of 7.5 uh, volts. This is a uh, sub-threshold, so you don't get any after depolarization, but uh, many experimental studies show that with uh, this type of stimulation, you normalize altered protein phosphorylation, uh, gene expression, protein expression, and contractile uh, performance uh, of uh, the myocardium. This is how the device uh, looks like. You have an electrode in the atrium and two uh, in the septum. The device stimulates over seven hours per day. And uh, 
needs uh, recharging uh, after uh, one uh, week uh, with this device which is uh, put on the skin. So uh, this symposium will cover in the following presentations the mechanisms by which cardiac contractility modulation impacts myocardial performance, review the results of randomized trials, and give an overview of ongoing prospective multi-center study. Thank you very much for your attention.